Krishna says in the Gita, whenever there is a decline of religion, O Arjuna, and a rise of irreligion, then I incarnate myself for the protection of the good, for the punishment of the evildoers, and for the firm establishment of religion, I am born in every age. In 1835, Kudiram, Ramakrishna's father went on a pilgrimage to Gaya. There he had a wonderful vision. A divine effulgence filled the Vishnu temple. The Lord affectionately said to him, Kudiram, your great devotion has made me very happy. The time has come for me to be born once again on earth. I shall be born as your son. Choked with emotion, Kudiram said, No, my lord, I am not fit for this favor. I am too poor and unworthy to serve you properly. Don't be afraid, Kudiram, the lord said. Whatever you give me to eat, I shall enjoy. When Kudiram awoke, he felt certain this was a divine revelation and that the Lord of the universe was actually about to be born into his household. Soon after, he returned to Kamarpukur. While Kudiram was in Gaya, Chandra Devi, Ramakrishna's mother, had a vision in front of the Yogi Shiva temple. She narrated her experience to Kudiram when he returned home. I saw the holy image of Lord Shiva inside the shrine was alive. It began to send forth waves of the most beautiful light. Slowly at first, then quicker and quicker. They filled up the inside of the temple and then they came pouring out. It was like one of those huge flood waves in the river, right towards me. Then the waves washed over me and swallowed me up. And I felt that marvelous light enter into my body. Since then, I have been full of joy and my health is better than ever. Only, I feel that light is still inside me and I believe that I am with child. Kudiram then told his wife about the vision he had in Gaya. The holy couple rejoiced together in anticipation of the divine child. Ramakrishna was born on February 18, 1836 at Kamarpukur a remote village of Bengal. In 1951, a temple was built on the spot of his birth. This village had many shrines and was filled with palm trees, ponds and rice fields. Ramakrishna's parents were poor and pious Brahmins. It is in the huts of the lowly where one attains intimate knowledge of the poor 
the oppressed and the miserable. That is perhaps why these great souls, the world teachers, are attracted to such homes at the time of their birth. Dhani, Ramakrishna's nurse and godmother, assisted in his birth and marvelled at his beauty. Later, during his sacred thread ceremony, Ramakrishna accepted the first offering of cooked food from her hands, rather than the traditional offering from his own mother. In Kudiram's holy family, God came first and everything else followed. He had a shrine where he worshipped the family deities. Sitala on the left. Early in the morning, Kudiram would go, basket in hand, to pick flowers for the worship and at such times the goddess Sitala, who received his daily adoration, would appear before him as an eight-year-old girl dressed in red and wearing many ornaments. She would accompany him, smiling, and help him to pick flowers by bending the flowering branches of the trees. These visions filled his heart with joy. Shiva in the centre. Kudiram brought this stone emblem of Rameshwar Shiva from Rameshwaram in South India when he went there on a pilgrimage walking nearly 3,000 miles. Raghuvir on the right. Once Kudiram was tired on his way home and lay down under a tree near a field. There he had a vision of Sri Rama, his chosen deity. I've been there a long time, Rama said, pointing to a particular spot in the field. I have had nothing to eat and no one to look after me. Take me to your home. I want very much to be served by you. In later life, Ramakrishna talked about his parents. My mother was the soul of honesty and sincerity. She didn't know much about the ways of the world and was incapable of concealment. She said whatever was in her mind. My father spent most of his time in worship and meditation and telling his beads. Every day, while he was praying, his chest swelled and shone with a divine radiance and tears rolled down his cheeks. In his spare time, when he wasn't engaged in worship, he would make garlands for Sri Rama. The villagers respected him as a sage. This is the map of Kamarpukur village hallowed by the memories of Ramakrishna's boyhood days. This small village has many small temples, thatched huts, trees and groves, canals and ponds. It is surrounded by rice fields. The cow herds graze their cows, play and sing. Ramakrishna was brought up in this natural environment vast blue skies above and a vast meadow below. In front of this Pines Shiva temple, Ramakrishna acted in the role of Shiva in a religious drama during a Shiva Ratri festival. He became so immersed in the thought of Shiva that he lost all external consciousness. This state continued until sunrise the next day. The village of Anur is two miles north of Kamarpukur. The goddess Vishalakshi is the deity of the temple there. Once, when Ramakrishna was a young boy, he went on a pilgrimage to the temple with some women of Kamarpukur. On the way, he was singing the glory of God and went into Samadhi. The women were terrified, thinking he was dead. They fanned him and sprinkled water on his head and eyes. They prayed to the goddess, O Mother Vishalakshi, save us, protect us 
look upon us with compassion. After a while, Ramakrishna regained normal consciousness. Ramakrishna recalled in later life his first experience of cosmic consciousness. He said, One morning I took some parched rice in a small basket and was eating it while I walked along the narrow ridges of the rice fields. In one part of the sky a beautiful black cloud appeared, heavy with rain. I was watching it and eating the rice. Very soon the cloud covered almost the whole sky and then a flock of cranes came flying. They were as white as milk against that black cloud. It was so beautiful that I became absorbed in the sight. Then I lost consciousness of everything outward. I fell down and the rice was scattered over the earth. Some people saw this and came and carried me home. This large open mango orchard was dedicated by Manik Chandra Banerjee for public use and was used by Ramakrishna and his friends to perform the Krishna Leela and other dramas. This small lake, Haldarpukur, is where Ramakrishna and the villagers used to bathe and swim. Pointing to Haldarpukur, Ramakrishna told this parable. God has covered all with his Maya. Maya is lust and gold. He who puts Maya aside to see God can see him. Once, when I was explaining God's actions to someone, God suddenly showed me the lake at Kamarpukur. I saw a man removing the green scum and drinking the water. The water was as clear as crystal. God revealed to me that Satchitananda is covered by the scum of Maya. He who puts the green scum aside can drink the water. This is Chinu's house. He was a maker of shell bracelets. He was deeply devoted to God and was instinctively aware of the divinity of Ramakrishna. Once he brought Ramakrishna to his home and secretly worshipped him with flowers and sweets as the incarnation of Lord Vishnu. This rest house was built by the Laha family for pilgrims, wandering monks and other wayfarers. Ramakrishna very often enjoyed the company of the monks and delighted in listening to their stories about saints and holy places. Once he came home with his cloth torn up and worn in three pieces as holy men wear theirs. Look, mother, he cried, I am a monk. This spacious bungalow of the Lahas was the village school where Ramakrishna learned simple reading and writing. Ramakrishna was seven years of age when his father passed away. Consequently, he became more solitary and meditative and he began to help his bereaved mother with household duties, including the worship of the family deities. Ram Kumar, Ramakrishna's oldest brother, started a school in Calcutta. Once when he was visiting Kamatpakur, he noticed that Ramakrishna was indifferent to his studies. He decided then to bring Ramakrishna to Calcutta so that he could supervise his education and have him assist in priestly duties. Ram Kumar tried to persuade his brother to pursue his studies, but his efforts were in vain. Ramakrishna spurned this type of education which he described as mere breadwinning. A few months stay in Calcutta had already shown Ramakrishna the drift 
of people's minds as well as their motives. They were running after transitory pleasures of the world and craving name and fame. He saw that God, spirituality and religion were mere empty words, the import of which had long been forgotten, and that holy books were the legacy of a superstitious ancestry, not worth the paper on which they were written. He realized more and more that he was born for purposes different from those of ordinary men, and that he must lead a life commensurate with those purposes. Sometimes he used to sit in front of the Tantanya Kali temple in the central part of Calcutta. It shocked him when he saw the priests gossiping and playing cards in front of the temple. He could not bear their insincerity. Rani Rasmani, a rich woman of Calcutta, founded the Kali temple of Dakshineshwar. She was very devout and known for her love and sympathy for the poor. In 1847, Rani Rasmani started on a pilgrimage by boat to Varanasi. On the way, the Divine Mother appeared to her in a dream and said, you need not go to Varanasi. Install my image on a beautiful spot along the bank of the Ganga and arrange for my worship and offerings there. In this image, I shall be constantly present and shall ever accept your worship. Rasmani immediately cancelled her pilgrimage and began organizing the construction of the temple. Construction began in 1847 and was completed in 1855 at a cost exceeding one and one half million rupees. Besides the temple for the Divine Mother Kali, 12 Shiva temples and a Krishna temple were also built. As Sister Nivedita once wrote, humanly speaking, without the temple of Dakshineshwar, there could have been no Ramakrishna. Without Ramakrishna, no Vivekananda. And without Vivekananda, no Western mission. The whole story began with a building erected on the bank of the Ganga, a few miles north of Calcutta. On May 31st, 1855, Ram Kumar officiated at the installation ceremony of the Kali temple. Ramakrishna was present at the dedication ceremony. A few months later, the image of Krishna fell from the priest's hands and one foot of the image was broken. According to Hindu tradition, a broken image cannot be worshipped so the scholars agreed that it should be immersed in the Ganga and replaced by a new image. Rani Rasmani had worshipped the image and could not bear to see it destroyed. So, at her son-in-law, Matur's suggestion, she consulted Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna said in an exalted mood, If any one of the Rani's sons-in-law were to break a leg, would she forsake him? and put someone else in his place? Wouldn't she rather have him cured by a doctor? Let it be the same in this case. Mend the image and worship it as before. Ramakrishna himself skillfully mended the image. Then, at the request of Rani and Mathur, Ramakrishna agreed to become the priest of the Krishna temple. Within a year of these events, Ram Kumar suddenly died and Ramakrishna assumed the responsibility of worshipping the Divine Mother Kali. One day, Mathur unexpectedly visited the temple and observed Ramakrishna worshipping the Divine Mother in a God-intoxicated state. He later said to Rasmani, We have got an extraordinary worshipper. It seems the Goddess will be awakened soon. The death of his brother Ram Kumar was a great shock to Ramakrishna. As he continued to perform the worship of the Divine Mother in the temple, he became more and more absorbed in God-intoxicated moods. He felt the transitoriness of the world, and his sole desire was to have 
the vision of the mother. He once described his struggle for that vision. Impatient on account of the separation from the Divine Mother, I rubbed my face against the ground so vehemently that it became cut and bruised and bled in many parts. I had no consciousness of how the whole day slipped away in prayer, meditation, devotional exercises, offering of the Self, and so on. When afterwards, at the approach of evening, conch shells were blown and bells rung, I remembered that the day was at an end. Another day passed in vain, and I had not yet seen Mother. Intense sorrow seized me, and I threw myself violently on the ground, saying, Mother, thou hast not shown thyself to me even yet. About his first vision of the Divine Mother, he said, I was then suffering from excruciating pain because I had not been blessed with a vision of the Mother. I felt as if my heart were being squeezed like a wet towel. I was overpowered by a great restlessness and a fear that it might not be my lot to realize her in this life. I could not bear the separation any longer. Life did not seem worth living. Suddenly, my eyes fell on the sword that was kept in the mother's temple. Determined to put an end to my life, I jumped up like a madman and seized it, when suddenly the Blessed Mother revealed herself to me, and I fell unconscious on the floor. What happened after that externally, or how that day or the next passed, I do not know. But within me there was a steady flow of undiluted bliss altogether new, and I felt the presence of the Divine Mother. Ramakrishna's God-intoxicated behavior was often misunderstood by the temple officials. They questioned his manner of worship because it was not traditional, and they complained about him to Mathur. One day, Ramakrishna was pacing back and forth on the northeastern veranda of his room in Dakshineshwar. He was in a spiritual mood, completely oblivious of his surroundings. Mathur was then seated alone in a room of the mansion and was watching him through a window. All of a sudden, Mathur ran out of the house, threw himself down at Ramakrishna's feet and began to cry profusely. What are you doing? said Ramakrishna in alarm. You are an aristocrat and Rani Rasmani's son-in-law. What will people say if they see you acting like this? Calm yourself. Please get up. Mathur gradually regained control of himself and said, Father, as he called Ramakrishna, I was watching you just now as you walked back and forth. I saw it distinctly. As you walked toward me, you were no longer yourself. You were the Divine Mother Kali from the temple. Then, as you turned around, and walked in the opposite direction, you became Lord Shiva. At first I thought it was some kind of optical illusion. I rubbed my eyes and looked again, but I saw the same thing. As often as I looked, I saw it. After that, Mathur asked the temple officials not to interfere with Ramakrishna's worship in any way. One day, Ramakrishna entered one of the Shiva temples at Dakshineshwar and began to recite the Shiva Mahimna Stotra, a beautiful hymn in praise of Shiva. Asita Giri Samam Syatu Kajjalam Sindhu Patre Suratar Varshakha Lekhani Patramurvi Lekhati Yadi Grihitva Sharada 
सर्वकालम् तदपि तव गुणानामिश पारं नयाति He was soon overpowered with emotion at the thought of the great glory of Shiva and forgot the world. O oh Lord, how can I describe thy infinite glory? were the only words that came from his lips. Tears began to flow profusely from his eyes. His strange conduct attracted attention and people began to gather around him. Mathur also hurried there. One of the temple employees suggested that this madman be moved away from the deity. But Mathu replied that anyone touching Ramakrishna would do so at his own peril. One day, Rani Rasmani went to the Kali temple. Ramakrishna was then performing worship there, so she asked him to sing some devotional songs in praise of the mother. Cherish my precious mother, Shama, tenderly within, O mind. May you and I alone behold her, letting no one else intrude. After singing a short while, he suddenly stopped, turned to Rani and exclaimed, Shame on you, to think such thoughts even here. And he pushed her with the palm of his hand. Her attendants were shocked, but the Rani remained calm and said, He is not to blame. The Divine Mother herself punished me and illumined my heart. She marveled that Ramakrishna knew she was thinking of a lawsuit instead of listening to his song. M, the recorder of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna once said, When you see Dakshineshwar, you will have an idea of what Ramakrishna's surroundings were like. The temple garden was the setting for many divine scenes. When you enter his room, visualize the master seated with his disciples and talking to them about divine matters. We always found the master absorbed in spiritual moods. Sometimes he would be in samadhi. This is the Chandni, the main landing ghat of the Dakshineshwar temple garden. Ramakrishna used to bathe here. On each side of the Chandni are six Shiva temples. The magnificent temple of Mother Kali draws and captivates pilgrims from all over the world. The goddess Kali, the presiding deity, is here represented as Bhavatarini, the redeemer of the sufferings of the world. The Nat Mandir, or the Great Hall, is open on all sides and faces the main shrine. It is used for meditation, recitals of religious music, religious ceremonies, and dramas. The Krishna temple. It is next to the Kali temple and is where Ramakrishna first assumed his priestly duties. Standing here on the semicircular veranda on the west side of his room, Ramakrishna used to watch the Ganga. Ramakrishna's wife, Sharada Devi, used to live here in the Nahabat, 
or concert tower. The Bakulthala Ghat, next to the Nahabat. Ramakrishna had a vision here, which he later described. Oh, what an ecstatic state it was. Even the slightest suggestion would awaken my spiritual consciousness. I worshipped the beautiful in a girl 14 years old. I saw that she was the personification of the Divine Mother. One day, I saw a woman in blue standing near the Bakul tree. She was a prostitute, but she instantly kindled in me the vision of Sita. I forgot the woman. I saw that it was Sita herself on her way to meet Rama after her rescue from Ravana in Ceylon. For a long time I remained in Samadhi, unconscious of the outer world. Here is the Panchavati, where Ramakrishna practiced many spiritual disciplines. Later Ramakrishna related, God made me pass through the disciplines of various paths, first according to the Puranas, then according to the Tantra. I also followed the disciplines of the Vedas. At first I practiced sadhana in the Panchavati. I made a grove of tulsi plants and would sit inside it and meditate. Sometimes I cried with a longing heart, Mother, Mother, or again, Rama, Rama. While repeating the name of Rama, I sometimes assumed the attitude of Hanuman. I was in a God-intoxicated state. At that time, I used to put on a silk robe and worship the deity. What joy I experienced in that worship. Under the bell tree, I practiced various sadhanas prescribed in the Tantra. Bhairavi Brahmani, a woman guru, would go during the day to places far from Dakshineshwar and collect the various rare things mentioned in the Tantrika scriptures. At nightfall, she would ask me to come to one of the seats. The Brahmani put me through all the disciplines mentioned in the main 64 Tantras. Most of these were extremely difficult sadhanas, but the infinite grace of the Mother carried me through them unscathed. The Kuti, or mansion, where Rani Rasmani and Mathur stayed when they visited Dakshineshwar. Ramakrishna lived in this room of the mansion for 16 years. This is Ramakrishna's room in the northwest corner of the temple complex. Ramakrishna lived here for 14 years. In Kamatpakur, Ramakrishna's mother, Chandramani, heard rumours that Ramakrishna was mad. So she prayed and practised hard austerities, hoping to receive divine grace for his cure. She went first to the local Gopeshwar Shiva temple and then to the Mukundapur Shiva temple. Within three days, Lord Shiva appeared before her saying, Don't be afraid. Your son is not mad. He is in that state on account of a tremendous awakening of the Divine Spirit in him. At his mother's request, Ramakrishna returned to Kamarpakur in 1858. There, Ramakrishna spent much of his time in meditation in either of the two cremation grounds called Butirkal and Buduhi Moral, just outside the village. These were lonely places and were shunned by the villagers as haunted. A cremation ground is traditionally regarded as the favourite abode of Mother Kali, so Ramakrishna chose these places for his meditation and worship. Sometimes he would offer food to jackals and spirits. If he stayed out very late, his elder brother Rameshwar would go and call him 
from a distance. Sri Ramakrishna would reply, All right, brother, I am coming, but don't you come any closer. The spirits might harm you. Chandramani and Rameshwar decided to arrange Ramakrishna's marriage, but a suitable bride could not be found. When Ramakrishna heard about it, he said in an ecstatic mood, It is useless to try here and there. Go to Jairambati, and there you will find the bride reserved for me in the house of Ramchandra Mukhopadhyay. In May 1859, Ramakrishna was married to Ramchandra Mukhopadhyay's daughter, Sharada Mani Devi. Once Ramakrishna was going in a palanquin from Kamarpakur to his nephew Ride's home in the village of Sihar. On the way, he had a wonderful vision. He saw two beautiful young boys suddenly emerge from his body. They were Chaitanya and Nityananda. Sometimes walking slowly forward, sometimes running playfully here and there, sometimes going in the fields in search of wild flowers, and at other times walking beside the palanquin, they laughed and joked and conversed and made merry as boys will. In this way, they proceeded happily for a long time, and then they came back and re-entered his body. Many years later, Ramakrishna described another incident. After visiting Ride's house at Sihar, I was taken to Shambazar. I had a vision of Gauranga before I entered the village, and I realized that I would meet Gauranga's devotees there. For seven days and nights, I was surrounded by a huge crowd of people. Such attraction! Nothing but kirtan and dancing day and night. People stood in rows on the walls and were even in the trees. I stayed at Nathavar Goswami's house. It was crowded day and night. In the morning, I would run away to the house of a weaver for a little rest. There, too, I found that people would gather after a few minutes. They carried drums and cymbals with them, and the drum constantly played Thakuti, Thakuti. We would have our meal at three in the afternoon. The rumour spread everywhere that a man had arrived who died seven times and came back to life again. Ride would drag me away from the crowd to a paddy field for fear I might have an attack of heat exhaustion. The crowd would follow us there like a line of ants. People came thronging from distant villages. They even spent the night there. At Sham Bazaar, I learnt the meaning of divine attraction. When God incarnates himself on earth, he attracts people through the help of Yoga Maya, his divine power. People become spellbound. When Ramakrishna returned to Dakshineshwar in 1860, his divine madness reappeared. He realized that lust and gold are the two great stumbling blocks to spiritual life. One day he threw away both money and clay into the Ganga, saying, money is clay and clay is money. He also worshipped his wife as the divine mother and invoked the divinity in her. Thus, he transcended the idea of lust and greed. Through an image of Ramlala, the child Ramachandra, Ramakrishna practiced the affectionate attitude towards God. He said, One day I was going to bathe in the Ganga. Ramlala insisted on accompanying me, so I took him with me. But he would not come out of the water, nor did he heed my remonstrances. Then I got angry, and pressing him under the water said, now play in it as much as you like. Ah, 
I saw him struggling for breath. Then, repenting of my act, I took him up in my arms. In this cottage in 1864, Thotapuri, an itinerant monk, initiated Ramakrishna in non-dualistic Vedanta. Ramakrishna attained Nirvakalpa Samadhi, the culmination of Vedantic experience, in just three days. During the 1860s, Ramakrishna also practiced Islam under this banyan tree of Dakshineshwar. Govinda Roy, a Sufi, initiated him. He later related, I devoutly repeated the name of Allah, wore a cloth like the Arab Muslims, said their prayers five times daily, and felt disinclined even to see images of the Hindu gods and goddesses, much less worship them. For the Hindu way of thinking had disappeared altogether from my mind. I spent three days in that mood, and I had the full realization of the sadhana of their faith. Shambhu Malik, a devotee of Ramakrishna, often read the Bible to him. One day in 1874, Ramakrishna visited Jadu Malik's garden house, which was adjacent to the Dakshineshwar temple garden. In Jadu's parlor was a picture of the Madonna and the child Jesus. Ramakrishna was looking at the picture when suddenly he noticed that the figures of the mother and child began to shine and that rays of light came out of them and entered his heart. A few days later, while Ramakrishna was walking in the Panchavati, he saw a tall, stately man with fair complexion coming towards him. A voice from within told him, This is Jesus the Christ, the great yogi, the loving son of God and one with his father, who shed his heart's blood and suffered tortures for the salvation of mankind. Jesus then embraced Ramakrishna and merged into his body. After realizing God through different faiths, Ramakrishna taught, as many faiths, so many paths. Truth is one. Sages call it by various names. He later described his cosmic experience. I began to perceive God in all beings. Formal worship dropped away. You see that bell tree? I used to go there to pluck its leaves. One day, as I plucked a leaf, a bit of the bark came off. I found the tree full of consciousness. I felt grieved because I had hurt the tree. One day, I tried to pick some durva grass, but I found I couldn't do it very well. Another day, I was about to gather some flowers. They were everywhere on the trees. At once, I had a vision of the cosmic god. It appeared that his worship was just over. The flowers looked like a bouquet placed on the head of the deity. I could not pick them. In 1868, Ramakrishna went on a pilgrimage by train with Mathur and his family. They stopped first at Dyoga to visit the Vaidyanath Shiva temple. Ramakrishna was greatly distressed to see the wretched condition of the people in a nearby village. Moved with sympathy for them, he said to Mathur, You are the steward of the mother. Feed these poor people and give everyone a piece of cloth. Mathur at first hesitated, saying, This pilgrimage will cost a lot of money and there are a lot of people. We may be short of funds on the journey if we try to feed and clothe them. So what do you say to this, Father? But Ramakrishna was inexorable. He shed tears at the sight of such abject misery and said in anguish, Shame on you! I am not going to Varanasi. I prefer to remain with these helpless people. 
Mathur then fulfilled Ramakrishna's wish. From Vaidyanath, the pilgrims went to Varanasi, the city of light. While there, Ramakrishna went almost every day in a palanquin to pay his obeisance to Vishwanath, the principal deity of Varanasi. Ride accompanied him on foot. Even on the way to the temple, the master would enter Bhava Samadhi, not to speak of when he saw the deity. He also visited the Annapurna temple and had a vision of Annapurna made of gold. Ramakrishna stayed in this house near Kedargat. He said, One day I was seated in the drawing room with Mathur Babu, Raja Babu and others. Hearing them talk about various worldly things, such as their business losses and so forth, I wept bitterly and said to the Divine Mother, Mother, where have you brought me? I was much better off in the temple garden at Dakshineshwar. Here I am in a place where I must hear about woman and gold. But at Dakshineshwar I could avoid it. This is the image of Lord Kedarnath in Varanasi. Ramakrishna experienced deep samadhi here. This is the cremation ground of Manikarnika on the bank of the Ganga. Ramakrishna narrated his vision. I saw a tall figure with a white body and tawny matted locks steadily approach each funeral pyre and tenderly lift up the jiva or the individual soul and breathe into its ears the supreme mantra. The gracious mother of the universe was seated on the other side of the pyre, removing one after another all the layers of bondage of the jiva. And after unlocking the gate of nirvana, she sent the fortunate soul to the absolute. Ramakrishna met Trilanga Swami, an illumined soul and the living manifestation of Vishwanath. Ramakrishna said that Varanasi was sanctified by the presence of this holy man. Ramakrishna then went to visit Mathura, the birthplace of Krishna. At the very site of Dhruva Ghat, Ramakrishna had a vision of Vasudeva crossing the Jamuna, carrying in his arms the baby Krishna who had just been born to him and Devaki. Vasudeva was protecting the child from the murderous resolve of the tyrant Kamsa. Ramakrishna then went to Brindavan, the playground of Krishna's early life. He stayed in this house near the Niduban. Once he told about the experiences he had in Brindavan. One evening I was taking a stroll on the beach of the river Jamuna. There were small thatched huts on the beach and big plum trees. It was the cow dust hour. The cows were returning from the pasture, raising dust with their hooves. I saw them fording the river. Then came some cowherd boys crossing the river with their cows. No sooner had I beheld this scene than I cried out, O oh Krishna, where are you? and became unconscious. Gangamai of Brindavan became very fond of me. She was an old woman who lived all alone in a hut near the Niduban. Referring to my spiritual condition and ecstasy, she said, He is the very embodiment of Radha. Ramakrishna also went to Prayag with Mathur and he bathed in the confluence of the holy rivers. They stayed there three nights and then returned to Dakshineshwar. Ramakrishna met many of the great savants of India. He did not want to be isolated in the temple garden of Dakshineshwar. He wanted to know the needs of the age and be familiar with the religious movements of India. He met Devendranath Tagore, the leader of the Adi Brahmo Samaj, in this Tagore castle in Jorasanko. One day, 
Ramakrishna said to Mathur, I have heard that Devendra Tagore thinks of God. I would like to see him. All right, said Mathur, I will take you to him. We were fellow students in the Hindu college. They went to Devendra's home and Devendra recited some texts from the Vedas for them. He also said, this universe is like a chandelier and each living being is a light in it. Ramakrishna was very fond of Keshav Sen, the founder of the Navavidhan Brahmo Samaj. He said, I first met Keshav Sen at a meeting of the Adi Samaj. Several members of the Samaj were sitting on the platform. Keshav was in the middle. I saw him motionless as a log. Pointing to Keshav, I said to Mathur Babu, Look there, that bait has been swallowed by a fish. Because of his power of meditation, he achieved what he wanted, name, fame and so forth through the grace of God. Ramakrishna also met Swami Dayananda Saraswati, the founder of the Arya Samaj in Calcutta. One day, Ramakrishna also went to see Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar, the great social reformer of India. Ramakrishna said to him, God laughs on two occasions. He laughs when the physician says to the patient's mother, Don't be afraid, mother. I shall certainly cure your boy. God laughs, saying to himself, I am going to take his life, and this man says he will save it. The physician thinks he is the master, forgetting that God is the master. God laughs again when two brothers divide their land with a string, saying to each other, This side is mine and that side is yours. He laughs and says to himself, This whole universe belongs to me, but they say they own this portion or that portion. Ramakrishna also met Bankim Chandra Chatterjee, the great novelist of Bengal. He said to Bankim, I understand you are a great pundit and have written many books. Please tell me what you think about man's duties. Bankim answered, If you ask me about them, I should say they are eating, sleeping and sex life. Ramakrishna rejoined, Ah, uh, you are very saucy. What you do day and night comes out through your mouth. A man belches what he eats. If he eats radish, he belches radish. In 1883, Ramakrishna met Rabindranath Tagore, the great poet of India, at a Brahmo festival in Calcutta. When the evening service began in the temple with the ringing of bells and the blowing of conch shells, Ramakrishna would climb to the roof of the building. Writhing in anguish, he would cry at the top of his voice, Come, my boys, or oh, where are you? I cannot bear to live without you. Gradually, people from all over came to Ramakrishna and he would talk about God as many as 20 hours a day. In 1881, Vivekananda met Ramakrishna at a devotee's house in Calcutta and sang this song. Let us go back once more, O mind, to our own abode. Here in this foreign land of earth, why should we wander aimlessly in strangers' guise? These living beings round about and the five elements are strangers to you, all of them. None is your own. Why do you thus forget yourself in love with strangers, O oh my mind? Why do you thus forget your own? <laughs> Oh, 
The next time Vivekananda met Ramakrishna at Dakshineshwar, he asked, Sir, have you seen God? Ramakrishna immediately replied, Yes, I have seen him just as I see you here, only more intensely. It was Vivekananda who brought the message of Vedanta to the West in 1893. Just a few days before Swami Brahmananda's coming, Ramakrishna had a vision in which the Divine Mother put a child on his lap and told him that this was his spiritual son. Swami Brahmananda later became the first president of the Ramakrishna order. One day at Dakshineshwar, Ramakrishna in a state of ecstasy sat on Swami Saradananda's lap. He said afterwards, I was testing how much weight he could bear. Swami Saradananda later came to America to preach Vedanta and after that became the General Secretary of the Ramakrishna Math and Mission. He also wrote a monumental biography of Ramakrishna in Bengali, Sri Ramakrishna Leela Prasanga, published in English as Sri Ramakrishna, the Great Master. Swami Turiyananda loved to study Vedanta and he lived a life of asceticism and continence. He even avoided women. One day, in answer to an inquiry from the master on this subject, he said, Oh, I cannot bear them. You talk like a fool, said the master reprovingly. Look down upon women? What for? They are the manifestations of the Divine Mother. Bow down to them as to your mother and hold them in respect. That is the only way to escape their influence. The more you hate them, the more you will fall into the snare. Turiyananda also came to America and taught Vedanta. Swami Abhedananda was young when he met his guru, Ramakrishna. He came to America and preached Vedanta from 1898 to 1921. During Ramakrishna's centenary in 1936, Swami Abhedananda paid his homage in Bengali, which was broadcast over All India Radio. Here is a part of his talk. Om Namo Bhagavate Ramakrishnaya Nobincha Satabdi Yuga Sandikhane Yavan Paschatta Jalavadi Bunna Sara Bharati Pravito Kriya Chila Krishan Dharmir Prabhav Samagra Hindu Samajir Mustishka Vikrita Kriya Sanatan Dharmi Purti Vitesh O Vitrista Anan Kriya Chila Dokani Dharma Glani Dur Kriya Sanatan Dharaki Punajivita Kriyar Janna Bhagavan Sri Ram Krishna Paramangsa Devi Subhagavan E Vishay Kriya Chila Tini Banga Deshir Sudur Ak Polikrami Janmagrahan Karen, O Nirakshar, Sadaron, Manser, Beshe, Sanatan, Akshar, Brahmir, Anubhuti Tara, Asadharan, Mahamadavati, Parichai Pradhan, Kriya Chilen, Shastri, Tarkojal, Tahar Mudde Chilana, Samano, Pratamik Shikhai, Tahar Vidyar, Parishamakti Hoya Chilo, Kintu, Amoni Chilo Tahar, Adaptikota, O Dibbo Onubuti, Ye Shakal Samasar, Samar Hani, Tini Korite, Samato Yachilen, Tini Bujia Chilen, Manushi, Ruchi, Kokono, Ak, Koite Parena, Boychitre Maji, Bichitro Hawaii, Savadi, Tai, Shakalki, Rokakuria, Shakali, Shaman, Pujadia, Sotan Ubuti, Aloki, Tini, Bajar Korilen, Jato Mok, Toto Tok, Sakal Dharmoi Sutto. 
কি অদ্ভুতি না ছিল তাহা ত্যাগ ও তপস্যাময় জীবন আমরা দক্ষিণেশ্বর ও কাশীপুরের বাগানেও তাহাকে দেখিয়াছি কোন ধাতু দ্রব্যই তিনি স্পর্শ করতে পারিতেন না শুধু তাই নয় নারী মাত্রেই ছিল তাহার চক্ষে সাক্ষাৎ জগন্মাতার প্রতিপত্তি ভগবান শ্রীরামকৃষ্ণদেব আমাদের বলিয়াছিলেন যিনি রামচন্দ্র ছিলেন যিনি শ্রীকৃষ্ণ ছিলেন তিনি ইদানী রামকৃষ্ণ রূপে অবতীর্ণ হইয়াছেন তিনি আরো বলিয়াছিলেন মা আমার ছবি দেখিয়ে বলেছিলেন এই ছবি ঘরে ঘরে পূজা হবে নিরঞ্জনম নিত্যম অনন্ত রূপম ভক্তানুকম্পা ধৃত বিগ্রহম বৈ ঈশাবতারম পরমেশমিদ্দম তং রামকৃষ্ণম শিরসা নমাম ও শান্তি 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 দিস ইজ দি ওনলি অভেলেবল রেকর্ডেড বয়স অফ এ ডিরেক্ট ডিসাইপল ব্রট আপ ইন অ্যান অ্যারিস্টোক্র্যাটিক ফ্যামিলি Swami Trigunathi Tananda, whose pre-monastic name was Sharada, looked upon some work as meant only for menials. One hot day, when Sharada went to Dakshineshwar, Ramakrishna said, Please bring some water and wash my feet. Many of Sharada's friends were there, which made the situation all the more embarrassing. His face flushed with humiliation, but Ramakrishna repeated the request and he felt compelled to obey. Later, he would say that this incident was the beginning of his education in the spirit of service. Swami Trigunathi Tananda became the head of the Vedanta Society of San Francisco in 1903. He died there in 1915. There were ten other monastic disciples of Ramakrishna who continued the mission of their master. Swami Shivananda, a knower of Brahman, and the second president of the order. This is the only motion picture available of two direct disciples of Ramakrishna. Swamis Shivananda and Subodhananda are walking in Belur Mat on the bank of the Ganga. Swami Premananda, the embodiment of love and purity. Swami Yogananda, an Ishvara Koti, a great soul. Swami Ramakrishnananda, who got this name for his unique service to the Master. Swami Adbhutananda, a miracle of Ramakrishna an illiterate shepherd boy who became a saint. Swami Niranjanananda, a man of indomitable energy and steadfast devotion. Swami Advaitananda, a man of God. Swami Subhodananda, an embodiment of simplicity and self-surrender. Swami Akanda Nanda, a great karma yogi and the third president of the order. Swami Vijnanananda, a knower of Brahman and the fourth president of the order. Besides this, Ramakrishna had many lay disciples who led God-centered lives following the instructions of their master. M the recorder of the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna was the headmaster of a school. Balram Basu, a rich landlord, was generous in supplying Ramakrishna's needs. Girish Chandra Ghosh was a brilliant actor and dramatist 
and a bohemian devotee of Ramakrishna. Girish once said, There is no sin which I have not committed, but still there is no end to the grace I have received from the Master. Aghoramani Devi, a woman devotee of Ramakrishna, had the vision of Gopala, child Krishna, after 30 years of hard spiritual disciplines. Once Ramakrishna said about her, she lives all by herself in a lonely room in a garden on the bank of the Ganga. She spends her time in Japam. Gopala sleeps with her. It is not imagination, but fact. She saw that Gopala's palms were red. He walks with her and they talk to each other. Yogindra Mohini Biswas was another of Ramakrishna's women disciples. Ramakrishna once remarked, Among women devotees, Yogin has the characteristics of a jnani. Golap Sundari Devi lost her husband, her son and her daughter, who had been married to the son of a very rich man. When she told Ramakrishna her sad story, he said in an ecstatic mood, You are fortunate. God himself helps those who have none else in the world to call their own. Ramakrishna was a man of joy and fun. Once he prayed to the Divine Mother, Mother, don't make me a dry monk. He attended plays at the theatre and he also enjoyed the circus, the zoo, the museum and sightseeing. He visited Kaligat in South Calcutta many times. He said to a devotee, one should continue in the thoughts that arise in one's mind in temples and holy places of pilgrimage. This is the Octoloni monument. Seeing it, Ramakrishna said, when one ascends the monument, the three or four storied buildings, tall trees and the grass growing low on the ground, all look alike. Similarly, the more you advance in spirituality, the less you will see the attributes of God. When I used to go to Calcutta with Hridai, he would show me the governor's palace and say, Look, uncle, there is the governor's palace with the big columns. The mother revealed to me that they were merely clay bricks laid one on top of another. God and his splendor. God alone is real. The splendor has but a temporary existence. Another day, I had gone to the Maidan in Calcutta for fresh air. A great crowd had assembled there to watch a balloon ascension. Suddenly, I saw an English boy leaning against a tree. As he stood there, his body was bent in three places. The vision of Krishna came before me in a flash. I went into Samadhi. I was taken to the zoological garden. I went into Samadhi at the sight of the lion, for the carrier of Mother Durga awakened in my mind the consciousness of the mother herself. In that state, who could see the other animals? I had to return home after seeing only the lion. I visited the museum once. I was shown fossils. A whole animal has become stone. Just see what effect has been produced by company. Likewise, by constantly living in the company of a holy man, one verily becomes holy. Ramakrishna went to this church on Amherst Street to see how the devotees of Jesus Christ offered their prayers to him. Though he had great veneration for Christ, he could not accept the emphasis on sin in Christianity. Under this banyan tree, in May 1885, Ramakrishna attended the Vaishnava festival at Panihati, which is a few miles north of Dakshineshwar. He sang and danced during Kirtan and then rested in Mani Sen's parlour. He said to Navadip Goswami, Too much study of the scriptures does more harm than good. 
the important thing is to know the essence of the scriptures. The essence of the Gita is what you get by repeating the word ten times. The word becomes reversed. It is then Tagi, which refers to renunciation. The essence of the Gita is, O man, renounce everything and practice spiritual discipline for the realization of God. In July 1885, Ramakrishna attended the car festival at Balram's house in Calcutta. This is Krishna's chariot, which Ramakrishna pulled. In this hall, Ramakrishna sang and danced with the devotees and inspired them. In the middle of 1885, Ramakrishna developed throat cancer and in September he moved from Dakshineshwar to Shampukur where he could receive better medical treatment. Holy Mother also went there to cook for him and nurse him. Ramakrishna lived in this room for nearly three months. He was treated by Dr. Sarkar and other doctors. Once when Ramakrishna went into Samadhi here, Dr. Sarkar and another doctor who was present examined the master's heart with a stethoscope. No heartbeat could be detected. Nor was there any reaction when the master's eyeball was touched with a finger. Both had to admit that science was powerless to explain this phenomenon. In spite of his fatal disease, Ramakrishna never stopped trying to help the devotees. Give up worldly talk altogether, he said. Don't talk about anything but God. If you see a worldly person coming near you, leave the place before he arrives. You have spent your whole life in the world. You have seen that it is hollow. Isn't that so? God alone is real and all else has only a two days existence. Since Ramakrishna's condition did not improve, the doctors suggested that he be moved out of the humid and smoggy atmosphere of Calcutta. He was taken to this garden house at Kasipur on December 11, 1885 and remained there until he passed away. The master, disregarding his fatal disease, kept training the young disciples for their spiritual mission and instilled in their minds an undying spirit of renunciation. On January 1st, 1886, Ramakrishna became Kalpataru, the wish-fulfilling tree at the location of the X, and blessed the devotees, saying, Be illumined. A couple of days before Ramakrishna's passing away, Vivekananda was alone with the master in his room. The thought came to Vivekananda's mind. If he can say now, while in the throes of death, I am God incarnate, then I will believe him. The master at once turned to him and said, Oh, are you still not convinced? He who was Rama and he who was Krishna is now Ramakrishna in this body. When Ramakrishna passed away on August 16, 1886, these two group photographs were taken. The disciples had lost their beloved master. His body was brought to the Kasipur cremation ground while they sang Kirtan and repeated, Victory to Ramakrishna. Ramakrishna's mortal life ended at Kasipur, and not long after, his disciples established the Ramakrishna monastery of Belur across the Ganga. While installing Ramakrishna's relics there, Vivekananda said, The Master once told me, I will go and live wherever you take me, carrying me on your shoulder, be it under a tree 
or in the humblest cottage. Pointing to Belur Monastery, Vivekananda said, It will be a centre in which will be recognised and practised a grand harmony of all creeds and faiths as exemplified in the life of Ramakrishna. And religion, in its universal aspect alone, will be preached. And from this centre of universal toleration will go forth the shining message of goodwill, peace and harmony to deluge the whole world. Krishna, you did. 